So you'll recall that we tried to show or give a give like the basic idea for why Fermat's little theorem was true last time, right? Uh, Fermat's little theorem says that if you have a prime P in any integer at all, then P divides into the P minus N, which you would you might think to yourself, so what? Why is that important? And you certainly might think to yourself, why in the world would that form kind of one of the bedrock ideas that would give us cryptography? Uh, and, and hopefully we'll see that by the end of today. But remember, the argument that we gave was a visual one, right? It, it sort of involved uh, these string beads that we were making with different colors and us simply recognizing that the little string beads kind of fall into groups of size P, correct? And we saw that it was important that P be prime. Otherwise, you know, the string beads might wrap back to where they started too soon. Like for instance, we saw that for P equal to six, like in this case right here, you had like a couple of groups of size three that were repeating themselves. And the reason that happened was because six is not prime, right? <laughs> It has a factor three and actually two as well. We've got two groups of size three of repeated string beads here, okay? So um, it was important that P be prime. Um, and then we have these things fall into these little groups of size P, in this case, P was five. And that means into the P minus N is divisible by P. Remember into the P was the total number of these string beads why did we subtract in? You remember why we were subtracting in? We got all of the ones that were just a single color, yeah? So we had in total colors, like for, so if n was three, maybe the red, green, and blue, the ones that just consisted of strings of size, just uh, uh, strings of just red or green or blue beads. Those wouldn't form a group, yeah? <laughs> those would just be on their own. So we kind of got rid of those and all the rest of them fell into these nice, uh, nice groups of size P. And that tells us that P actually divides this thing. We also got rid of the case where P was um, even. That was really easy for us to see why that was true. P equal to two is the only case we had to deal with there. And we also dealt with the situation where N happened to be negative or zero. <laughs> so we were able to reduce it to the case where N is a positive integer and P is an odd prime. And then Fermat's little theorem followed from there, okay? Uh, a couple of things, we saw that Fermat's little theorem is equivalent to the following statement. It basically means that, uh, you know, into the P, if I take that mod P, that is you take the remainder of Han division by P, that's the same as N mod P. Uh, because X mod M equal Y mod M means X minus Y mod M is zero, which means that M simply divides the difference between X minus Y, right? So P dividing into the P minus N, which is what Fermat's little theorem says, tells us that into the P minus N mod P is zero. That difference, when I compute the remainder upon division by P, that, that it's zero, divides perfectly, which in turn implies that into the P mod P is equal to N mod P, okay? So the remainder upon division by P of those two is the same. All of those things are equivalent to each other, okay? So that's, uh, that's cool. Remember we did that obnoxious example uh, on Wolfram Alpha, where I took that massive number and raised it to the, you know, 37th power. And we saw that in the end, that had the same remainder upon division by 37 that the number not raised to the 37 had. Okay. And uh, believe it or not, that's going to be critical to, um, to what we're going to talk about next, which is RSA cryptography. Okay. RSA stands for Rivest, Shamir, and Adelman. And those were the three individuals that found this thing. As, as I mentioned before, uh, several years before, and by the way, we're, this is literally like mathematically yesterday. Uh, I mean, <laughs> it was like basically 50 years ago that this happened uh, in the 70s. Um, it was at MIT where these three guys collaborated to um, come up with this scheme. And it's built on the it's built on the back of hundreds of years old number theory, right? We just saw that Fermat proved Fermat's little theorem in the mid 1600s, yes? 
it turns out that that's going to be important for, for uh, this cryptographic scheme that we're going to talk about here. And just before Rivish, Shamir, and Adelman gave their cryptographic scheme, uh, Diffie and Hellman actually uh, said that philosophically something called public key cryptography was possible. That is, I could publish something for everybody to see and everybody that wants to send me a message could actually encode their message with my public key. And that encoded message would not be in danger of being decoded by anyone. That seems weird, doesn't it? That I literally make something public for everybody to see and you could use that to encrypt the message, send it to me, and that's not in danger of being decoded by anyone but me because I have the private key. The thing, the other piece of the key that actually unlocks that thing. Uh, that was sort of surprising to everyone. Uh, Diffie and Hellman said that that was possible and they described philosophically how that might be possible. And then it was these guys that actually gave the mathematics, uh, the mathematical implementation of what Diffie and Hellman were talking about, okay? Again, if you really are interested in this sort of thing, you can go take Foundations of Cybersecurity uh, with Dr. Hammond. Uh, down in the CS department, uh, but he would he would give you a lot more insight into the specifics of, of uh, how RSA came about. But we're going to describe how it works uh, really rigorously. Okay. So again, this is what I said. Introduced in 1976 by three researchers. So literally, and this is like 40 44 years ago. Uh, actually discovered earlier by someone working working secretly in the uh, United Kingdom government. Uh, interestingly, a lot of these developments, uh, th this is the way things kind of happen sometimes. You have a particular problem and sometimes it'll be like nobody knows the answer and then suddenly two people will find the answer at the same time, okay? It happens a lot in math. Okay, so here's how this works. You ready? Okay, so, and uh, <clears throat> um, we're gonna describe why, um, why this system works just be using some of the number theory we know. So you have two parameters, N and E, that you call the public key, all right? Uh, N, N is going to be your modulus, okay? This uh, N right here is the modulus that you're gonna be working with. And E is, is basically a, an encryption power. So this is an encryption, encryption power. Okay, you're going to raise something to that power E to encrypt. And you're going to work modulo in. That's the public key. And by the way, if we were all kind of uh, secret agents in this room at the same time, we would all have our own public key. Does that make sense? I would have a public key. Ava would have a public key. Hannah would have a public key. All of us would have a public key. And if you didn't have one, we would all make fun of you and say, huh, where's your public key, right? Uh, we will all have our own public key where if I want to send a message to Hannah, what would I do? I would look up her public key. I would encrypt my message and send it to her. Yeah, that's how this is going to work. Okay, so whoever I wanna send the message to, if I wanna send a message to, to Anna, I would look up her public key, which everybody can see, and I would encrypt my message and send it to her. And it would not be in danger of, of being decrypted or decoded. Now, here's the thing that's weird. Once I encrypt my message, uh, once I encrypt my message with Anna's public key, I can't even decrypt it. You see, do you hear what I'm saying? I'm the one who made the message, and I'm the one who decrypted it. I wouldn't even be able to decrypt it because I don't have her private key, which is another piece of information we'll talk about soon, okay? So what is N? Well, N is the product of two massive primes, okay? In actuality, in, uh, in most implementations of RSA, P and Q are just highly likely to be primed, okay? But you guys, you guys realize that the list of primes is infinite, correct? I mean, that's what Euclid proved 
right? The list of primes is infinite, but do we know, are we aware of infinitely many primes right now? No, there's just a finite list of known primes to date, okay? And it would probably be a bad idea for me to implement an RSA system using two primes that are known to everybody on a finite list. Why? Well, because a hacker could simply go in with that same list and figure out what your primes are. Does that make sense? <laughs> so what you tend to do is you tend to actually use things called pseudo primes, things that are highly probable to be prime. And there are several uh, computer algorithms whereby you can actually come up with things that are highly likely to be prime. And there's a, something called uh, Rabin's uh, primality, uh, pseudo primality test. And you can basically be as certain as you want that something is prime, uh, not 100%, but like 99.99999% sure that something is prime. Now, even if you implement something with something you think is prime and it's not, the system still won't break down necessarily, okay? Uh, it will just be easier to crack because there will be more primes that divide your modulus and a hacker could potentially find, right? If you just have two primes that they have to stumble upon, that's harder than having like five primes that they could potentially stumble upon. That hopefully that kind of makes sense. But the modulus in general is just the product of two very large primes, okay? To hack the system, you would need to actually factor in into its uh, prime components. And that, my friends, is one of the hardest things uh, that I could ever ask you to do. One of the crown jewels in all of mathematics is so-called fast factorization of numbers, okay? Turns out that's equivalent to a lot of other things as well. If today you went to Chuck's and you were able to find a quick algorithm whereby one could factor something. And by the way, quick algorithm means you don't just try all the primes. That's, that's a stupid algorithm, okay? Uh, just trying all the primes is basically kind of what we do at present, yes? Yeah? So, I mean, we might be sort of sophisticated in the numbers that we try, for instance, but every single known factorization scheme to present is basically equivalent to you just trying all the primes. Yeah, this might sound weird, but, but it's true. So if you could find an efficient method to factor, to factor a number into its primes, uh, I guarantee you, you would be the most famous mathematician of all time, okay? You might be the most famous person of all time, actually, okay? But you also might be dead very quickly, okay? Uh, because this would be a, literally a crown jewel. It would be something that, you know, if a nation got a hold of that algorithm, that they could actually, uh, they, would, they would wield a lot of power for sure. Um, probably unhealth, unhealthily so, okay? Uh, there's actually a movie, it's pretty bad, it's pretty badly done. It's definitely like a B or C level movie. It's called P does not equal NP, okay? And it's essentially about a, a group of physicists and mathematicians that are working for the US government and they actually crack this problem. And the whole movie is in like one room and all they're doing is like trying to, they actually crack it and they all know they've cracked it. And they're in a computer scientist also. And why would a physicist be involved? Well, because actually, uh, you know, Newtonian or uh, quantum mechanics is, is actually a part of this problem now, which seems surprising, but it's true, okay? Quantum, that the qu quantum level uh, physics is actually an important part of this problem, believe it or not. So you have a physicist, a mathematician, and a computer scientist, which sounds like a bad joke, uh, but they happen to be in a room together and they crack, they know they've cracked the problem of fast factorization of numbers. And uh, all the movie is, is them kind of trying to sort out philosophically whether they, whether they actually reveal that they know how to do it or not. Does that make sense? So the whole movie is just about about kind of the ethics behind revealing that they know how to do this, okay? So fast factorization is very, very hard. Now, what about E? Well, uh, E has to be chosen so that it's relatively prime, not to N, not to N, but to, <laughs> which is PQ, uh, E has to be relatively prime to P minus one 
times Q minus one. By the way, would anybody else know what P minus one times Q minus one is besides, besides you? No, because, because you don't like, like you're the only one who knows P and Q. Does that make sense? Nobody else knows that. Okay. Why relatively prime to that? Well, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see why in just a minute. Okay. So again, N is P times Q. E, which is the encryption power, has to be relatively prime to the product of P minus one and Q minus one. Okay. We with it so far? Okay. All right. What do we do? Well, there's a number of ways to, to implement this, but uh, you know, this, I'm going to show you a very basic way to do this. So I have a message M, uh, you know, and which is kind of weird because that's a letter in and of itself, but the message is basically a string of, of characters, yes? So I might say, hi, let's go to Chuck's or something, right? Okay. Uh, so translate the message M into a string of numbers where we use, okay, we kind of start with zero, zero for A. So we start the counting of the numbers at zero, 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 one for B. Why am I using two digits? Well, uh, well, because, right? I mean, so because I, I have 26 letters, correct? Yeah. Uh, so you divide the string into blocks of two N digits where n is equal to the number of letters in the block. So, so I don't know, so let me see here. Uh, you know, what if I wanted to change the message hello into some numbers? Okay, well, h, what number corresponds to h? Okay, so, so the thing about it, so A, right, A corresponds to zero, zero, yes. So actually the, the letters are always numerically one less than, than you might, ex might expect, yes? Okay, so A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H is the eighth letter, therefore what number corresponds to H? Seven, so it's zero, seven, that's our H. And you kind of know that this one letter gave rise to these two digits, yes? Okay, and then you say E. Well, A, B, C, D, E, that is zero, four. Okay, so that's E. Okay, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, which is the 12th letter. Therefore, one, 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 right? So that's L, L, and then, and then O, yeah? What's that? L, M, N, O, you just gotta add three to, to that, yeah? So it's 14. Okay, so that's O, All right? So that, that's, you kind of, you translate the message into a string of numbers, yeah? And by the way, I mean, if you really do this in a sophisticated way, you could even have numbers that correspond to things like spaces and, you could have things that correspond to like exclamation points or something called the ASCII character code in computer science that you can use to do that if you really wanted to. You don't have to encode things the way that I'm doing right here. Okay. You just have to choose, you have to translate. You have to have a scheme whereby letters correspond to numbers somehow. Yeah, and this is one way to do it. So N is the number of letters in a block. Uh, 2N is the number of digits, right? If I have if I have N letters, capital N letters, then I'm gonna have two N digits total. Does that make sense? The number of digits is twice the number of letters, okay? Uh, so think about this. So two N, so I mean, think about this. What if I, remember, so N is equal to PQ, little N is equal to PQ. What if I did, of course, I have to pick primes that are big enough to accommodate the entire alphabet. Do you know what I'm saying? So like, uh, it would be stupid for me to pick P equal to three and Q equal to five. That wouldn't even allow me to be able to distinguish uh, all, all of the letters. Does that make sense? If, if P was equal to three and Q was equal to five, I would only be able to accommodate 15 different things. Does that, does that make sense? So I don't know. Maybe I do five and seven. Okay, so that would be 
35. Okay, or maybe I do, maybe I do n equal to, uh, let, let me just do a different one. I don't, I don't like that. That one's too little. And that would, I mean, anybody could hack that seriously, but anybody's going to be able to hack what I'm about to do anyways, but you know, what, whatever. Uh, so let's do P equal to, oh, I don't know, like 37. And let's do Q equal to uh, maybe like 101 or something like that, okay? Which are both prime. What is 37 times 101? I actually don't know. Well, actually, I do know off the top of my head. There'd be 30, what, what would it be? 37, 37, isn't that right? Yeah. Okay, so this part right here is what is what confuses people a lot. It's like, I can't send the whole message across because, because that number right there would get part of it would that this this message as a number would get obliterated by this modulus. Does that make sense? So what I do is I say, how many 25s can I string together and still stay smaller than this number? By the way, why 25? Well, because 25 corresponds to the letter what? Z. Does that make sense? This 25 right here, that's like the letter Z, which means I can accommodate that thing. So how many 25s can I string together in this case and still stay smaller than 37, 37? How many 25s can I string together? Two, right? So 25, 25 is less than, is less than 37, 37. So that means basically I can send stuff across two letters at a time. Two letters is what can be accommodated, okay? So I, I would send two letters at a time kind of across this channel to whoever I'm communicating with, okay? So 2525, 25, like if the number was bigger and I could accommodate more 25s, I could, I could send blocks of more letters if I wanted to. So that means how would I divide this thing up? Well, I would do H-E, yes, and then what? L-L, okay? And then a lot of times you say to yourself, well, if I'm gonna send two letters at a time, I don't have two letters at the end of this message. Sometimes you can put fluff on the end of a message. So for instance, I could put like an X, I can append like an X to the end of this. And of course, you know, anybody that speaks English can be like, hellox, what in the world? Well, oh, they must mean hello. It's just kind of understood that you can use X's or some other predetermined letter to kind of fill in fluff. So what, what number corresponds to X? 25 is Z. 24 is Y, 23, okay? So these would kind of be the letter, the, the three numbers that I would send across my channel, 704, 1111, and 1423, yeah? Uh, again, if I tried to incorporate more letters, the, no, the number I would get would be bigger than my modulus. Does that make sense? So if I did, you know, it, like if I did three letters, I would have 11, 14, 23. Well, that's already bigger than the modulus, which kind of destroys information, yes? So I'm trying to see how many letters I can string together and still stay smaller than the actual modulus itself. Okay, and 25, 25 in this case is the most I can do. 2n is the largest even digit such that the number, that thing with 2n digits is less than or equal to n. Okay, the message M is now a sequence of large integers, okay? In this case, what's my little m1? Little m1 is gonna be 704. Little m2, which is the second part of my message block is gonna be what? What would my little m2 be? Little m2 is 1111. And a little m3 is 1423. Okay, and then we encrypt each block, okay? You encrypt each block. And remember I said E is your encryption power, okay? So this thing is public. Everybody can see this thing, okay? The modulus and the encryption power. 
So what I do is I say, well, C1, that's gonna be M1 to the E mod my modulus, yes? So this is going to be 704 to the what? What am I gonna raise this? Uh, well, I, I would have to pick what E is, whatever E happens to be. And then I would take that modulo uh, 3737, okay? And C2 would equal something. And the question is, what should E be? Okay, to kind of make this thing work. But in the previous slide, we said that E had to be relatively prime to P minus one times Q minus one. That was the only stipulation we put out there. Okay, so that's how you encrypt this thing, yeah? Is this, is this kind of making sense? You have two digit numbers that correspond to letters. You, string, you figure out, okay, how many letters can I string together and still stay below the modulus? And that kind of naturally breaks up your message into chunks. And then you send across these message chunks to the person you want to by using their encryption key, okay? Their public encryption key. Any questions on this? We're gonna do some examples, but I just wanted to kind of lay it out there for right now. Questions? All right, let's do an example. This one's even more obnoxious, okay? Uh, so the encryption, so we encrypt the message for using RSA scheme with that public key. So this, that means that this guy the first guy is in, and the second guy is the encryption power, yeah? And I'm telling you this, that 38, or 38,021 factors as 197, 193 times 197, okay? Does this fit with RSA? Well, in order for it to fit with RSA, we would need, we would need for E equal to 25, needs to be relatively prime to uh, 192 times 196. What's 192 times 196? Uh, by the way, so E equal to 25, that's five squared. Do you understand what I'm saying? 192 times 196, I don't care what it is actually, because is this number, whatever it is, is, it, is that number divisible by five? Absolutely not divisible by five, yeah? If I were to multiply this out, this thing would end in a two, so it's not divisible by five. Therefore, 25 is relatively prime to this product, yes? So this thing is not divisible by five. So what can we conclude about 25 and, and this number, the product of 192 and 196? Whatever that is, 25 is relatively prime to it. Yes? 25 is relatively prime to this thing, okay? Does it fit with RSA? The other requirement, the other stipulation is that 193 and 197 would have to be prime. And, and they are, they are, they're actually, uh, they're, they're actually prime, okay? Now here's something that's kind of interesting. So are you on board that, that E is indeed relatively prime to 192 times 196? 193 and 197, those are both primes, I promise, okay? Uh, and, and by the way, in real life, you're gonna have primes that are much bigger than this. And incidentally, how many letters can we string together for this? How many 25s can I string together and still be smaller than 38,021. Certainly one, 25, one single 25 would work. What about two 25s strung together? Yes. What about three 25s? Nope. Okay. So 25, 25 is less than 38,021. So what does this tell us? How many letters are we gonna send across the channel at a time? Yeah, we're gonna do two letters at a time two letters. So that means we would kind of break this message up into two letter chunks. Yeah. Okay. So, 
or no, F O U R. So A, B, C, D, E, F, it's the sixth letter. So that would be O5. O, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O. It's the 15th letter. We already, so, so how does that encode as a, as a number? 14, okay. And then, uh, of course, I have to do UR, element O, okay, uh, element OP, QRS, okay, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, yes? So six more letters past O, therefore, what number encodes U? 20. O, P, Q, R. 17. You see it? Yeah? That's good. Okay, so 514 and 2017, 3821 is our modulus. So we're going to encrypt this. Let's go ahead and do that, all right? Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Oops. Okay, so I'm going to go on the old internet here. Okay, so let's see, Wolfram Alpha, okay. So what I need to do is I need to go 514 raised to the, oh man, I already forgot. What was the power that we had? 514 raised to the 25th. And I wanna take that mod 38021 and we'll, We'll say, okay, let's uh, let's figure out what this thing is. Okay, one, three, zero, seven, zero. Okay, so one, three, seven, one, three, zero, seven, zero. So let me just write this down, down here. Okay, so, or up here, 514 to the 25th mod, 38021 equals one, three, zero, seven, zero. And what about the other one? 2017 raised to the 25th, mod 38021. What's that gonna be? Okay, well, let's, let's check it out. Uh, 2017, okay, 14872. Okay, so this guy right here would be C1. That would be the first, uh, that would be the first bit of cipher text. Okay, the encrypted text. Okay, and then I would send the second thing across. Okay, and in theory, this should be secure, although it's not going to be in this case because the primes are so teensy. Yeah, 193 and 197 are pathetically small, but we're just trying to illustrate here. Okay, here's a link to an online RSA calculator. Okay, this thing's pretty cool. I'm gonna click on this, yes. Okay, let's go over here. Okay, so watch this. So I have these things right here. This RSA online calculator is pretty cool. What you do is you basically put in some, some things that you think are prime, okay, 193 and 197. You say set PQ and it will actually check to make sure these things are, are prime, okay? Uh, see, here's 3821. See that? And, and here's P minus 1 times Q minus 1. They call that R. All right? And then it turns out what you want to do next is you want to look at things that are congruent to 1 modulo R. Okay? And, and actually, so this candidates for things that are congruent to 1 modulo R. That means things that have a remainder of 1 upon division by R. Here are the options here, okay? And by the way, this guy, it, it, what you do is you look for things that actually factorize. Now, this, this guy right here obviously factorizes, doesn't it? I mean, look at it. Yeah? Okay? And, and by the way, so did this guy back here, just so that we're clear. That obviously is divisible by five. But this guy right here is actually divisible by 25. Do you know what I'm saying? 
which we kind of chose as our E. What I'm doing is I'm showing you right now that I can actually crack this system if I know what P and Q are, okay? So here's this. You told me what your encryption key was. It was 25, yeah? So I look for something right here that's equivalent to 25. I put it right here. I tell this thing to factor. Okay, do you guys see that this right here is 25? Yeah? Okay, that's 25. And then I have 41 times 257, which I'm gonna, I'll go ahead and compute what that is. 41 times 27, what's that? Or what, 41 times, what was it, 257? 257, 10,537. Okay, 10,537. I'm a hacker right now, by the way. 10,537, okay? I know that if I take 25 and I multiply it by 10,537 and I take that mod 38, or, or actually no, I take that mod P minus one times Q minus one, what am I gonna get? One, that means these two numbers are what of each other? Inverses, remember we've been talking about that? This was my E, okay, this guy right here was my E, and it turns out this guy is going to be sufficient to be a private key, something that someone, you know, that, that, I, that you can kind of keep to yourself. But since I knew what the factorization was, I was able to figure it out. This, this guy you oftentimes refer to as D, yeah? private key. If you find an inverse modulo P minus one, Q minus one for the encryption key, it turns out you'll be able to hack the system. Want me to prove it to you? Watch. What are the, what are the numbers? What are the encrypted numbers? Wasn't it one, three, zero, seven, zero? Yes. What I do is I would raise this. I would raise this thing to the private key that I just came up with. One, zero, five, three, seven. And I take this mod, what? What am I, what am I working modulo? Three, eight, zero, two, one. And watch, watch what spits out here. I-14, wasn't that the original message? Yeah? And what if I take one, four, eight, seven, two, and I raise that to the 10,537 mod 38,021. There it is, 2017, do you see what happened? So that encrypted text, once I find this private key that's simply an inverse of the encryption key modulo P minus one times Q minus one, uh, I basically have hacked the system, yeah? I can actually hack the system once I, once I know how to do that. So let me just go back over here, I wanna, I want to uh, follow this through. Uh, so look, here's the thing. E, what did I say? What, what did we say E was? 25. And what's D? 10,537. And this, this little thing will actually check to make sure things are working rightly. E is 25. D is this. Capital N, the modulus is this. R is this. Okay. E times D is that, which is one. So E and R are relatively prime, D and R are relatively prime, and their product happens to be one modulo P minus one times Q minus one. If you can, if you can figure out what P is, you will know what P and Q are, you'll know what P minus one times Q minus one is, and you'll be able to hack the system, yeah? And you've just seen that I was able to take ciphertext and get back to the other thing. And by the way, down here, and this thing, which, I mean, we'll look at it on Wednesday, but uh, there's actually other ways to encrypt things like using the ASCII character codes and whatnot, okay? But the scheme is basically that the ciphertext is your message raised to the encryption power mod in. And to go back, what do I do? You simply take the ciphertext and raise it to the inverse of E modulo in, okay? Or an inverse for E modulo in. Okay, so you raise that thing to the so-called private key, okay? All right, so I'm gonna do a couple more slides here. We're not gonna be able to finish this. We'll finish it on Wednesday. 
but that's the essence of what's happening here. You encrypt, in theory, no one should be able to come up with a decryption key, yeah? But you just saw that if I know the, the primes, I can come up with a, with a decryption key, right? So uh, just let's just kind of read through this right here. I'm gonna erase this so we can read through it and we'll see why this works tomorrow. So starting one this, from this decipher text, the decrypted blocks, you can simply take the cipher blocks and raise them to the D mod n. And I'm telling you that will decrypt the thing. You'll get the messages, the message blocks right back. And what's the relationship between D and E? They are simply inverses of each other, modulo P minus one times Q minus one. We call D the private key. If you don't know P and Q ahead of time, there is no known feasible method for factoring large N into primes to get P and Q, which then allows you to get D. Did you guys see that I concocted my own D when I knew what the primes were? That's what we just did, yeah? I was able to concoct my own private key, which would work. We just need any inverse of the public key. Any inverse modulo P minus one times Q minus one will work, okay? So do you guys see why it is that we were so obsessed with inverses at some point? Yeah? We we're obsessed with inverses. That's because of this, okay? And also we're gonna be obsessed with Fermat's theorem, Fermat's little theorem. That's the thing that's actually going to tell us why this happens to work, okay? But we'll have to see that next time. Any questions on this? Yeah. No, P and Q don't have to be prime. Uh, that, right, so, so the problem, is, the reason you want them to be prime is because it, it makes it harder to factor because you would have to stumble upon those specific two primes. But if, if, if a number is divisible by tons of primes, you're much more likely to stumble upon some of those. Does that make sense? Right, right. But you once you find a factor, you then reduce the problem and then you just kind of can reduce it from there. But yeah. Uh, so the, the math still works, even if uh, even if the number doesn't happen to be prime. Uh, actually, it won't work in some cases, I'll say that. But it does it doesn't it, it it's not necessary. Like, for instance, if, if you know the scheme is working, that doesn't necessarily impl imply that your two numbers happen to be prime. Okay, there are other situations that it happens to work in. It's a good question. Other questions? So, I mean, obviously you would check it, right, Grant? You would like, you would get these pseudo primes, things that you think are, are prime. You would check a couple messages. You would say, oh yeah, this seems like it's working. Are you 100% sure that what you're working with are primes? No, but you're pretty certain. But again, it's a bad idea to use a known prime because any hacker is gonna have access to the list of known primes, yeah? Okay, we'll come back next time and we'll see why does this work? That's the big question, okay?